The next segment that we're going to talk about today is really about what's new in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is really an exciting area where we've seen a lot of progress and new drug development. Uh, and I, I actually want to turn to Michael first. Uh, and just as with, with uh, indolent lymphomas, there's always a question in patients who are diagnosed with CLL when, uh, you know, when they present and they're often alarmed that their white cell counts are, are elevated, when do we tell a patient that they should be treated? So how do we, how do we make that decision in 2016? I think in 2016 the answer is uh, pretty much the same as it was uh, uh, 10 years ago, and uh, that uh, uh, the patients that didn't have bulky disease and uh, didn't have marrow failure and uh, during observation didn't have rapidly progressive disease. Uh, that is, they, they didn't double their uh, white cell count in a year, for example. Uh, these are the, the criteria that have uh, held up the, uh, for the test of time. But as Leo said, that they're, uh, they're pretty good uh, guides. But if you have uh, uh, a lymph node in a particular area, uh, you, uh, you're going to make different decisions based on that. And uh, we have to uh, say that the guidelines are guidelines that they're not absolutes and you just have to use your common sense. The, even in the, uh, the patients that uh, we worry about a lot at the present time, in the fish will have a 17P deletion. But uh, not all 17Ps behave the same. And in an unusual thing uh, in uh, MD Anderson history, we actually collaborated with the Mayo Clinic and found out that uh, patients that uh, were early stage disease with 17P deletion, uh, and many of these patients would not progress for long, long periods of time. And even some of them uh, with extended follow-up, uh, the 17P disappears. So that uh, I think there's still the indication if the 17P is going to be a bad actor, you'll be able to find that out fairly quickly. And uh, I think that one of the things that's happening at the present time is that uh, we're just uh, changing the 17P population that uh, we're treating because we're treating them in immediately and disregarding all the other characteristics. So that uh, uh, the, the worst part about uh, saying that you're going to put, uh, uh, you're going to consider this patient when you're talking to them as being in watch and wait, uh, they hate the term. Uh, you know, the patients have already defined that they call it watch and worry. And I think that uh, we're at the uh, present time, we're in the watch and investigate because uh, uh, we didn't do very much workup uh, in the patients that just had a little bit of CLL a long time ago. But uh, now we're able to look at uh, the genetic parameters in l with a lot more sophistication and uh, so that there are studies that are already ongoing in the traditional watch and wait uh, where Ibrutinib, uh, which doesn't cause uh, the DNA damage and uh, the immune suppression that uh, fludarabine and alkylating agents cause, uh, that these are being actively studied to see if we can uh, get the patients free of disease and what the consequences of that are, but that's way too early for us to consider. So I think the, N uh, the NCI guidelines, which are now the IWCLL criteria, uh, are presently being reevaluated, and there's virtually no change in the uh, indications for treatment in the uh, next iteration coming along. So the uh, question then comes up as to uh, what uh, are the treatments that you offer to different subsets of patients? And uh, as you're aware, uh, the FDA and the uh, uh, European agencies have uh, accepted that uh, the FCR program with fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, rituximab is uh, the, the standard for young, fit adults. Uh, and, you know, there's uh, some discussion as to whether the 65 is the right thing or whether it should be 70 or exactly what. But one of the uh, big holes that we have is that uh, uh, there's nothing for, uh, uh, that's been approved really for patients that are over the age of 70. And the average age of diagnosis of CLL is 72. So uh, we can either be uh, uh, the, like the optimist that says, let's concentrate on the, uh, the donut and not the hole. Uh, but uh, the hole is very big in uh, what the approved indications are. So we're now at a situation where uh, we have an approved drug, uh, Ibrutinib, for all uh, stages of CLL. 
So the uh, temptation is to uh, say to the uh, patients, well, we'll give you this oral medication that's very well tolerated, etc., and um, go blissfully uh, forward. But many patients uh, that are coming to see us at tertiary centers, at least, are saying, you know, should I be doing that? Because uh, the FCR program in uh, the patients that are uh, mutated immunoglobulin heavy chain sequence, um, two thirds of those patients will probably be disease free out to, uh, you know, uh, 12 to 18 years. And, uh, and you won't have to be on treatment all the time. And uh, while we've been very happy uh, that we have such wonderful uh, results uh, early in, uh, in all of our uh, uh, targeted therapies, the long-term consequences are now becoming more of a chore and uh, more aggravating to patients. And uh, we might say, well, they have aches and pains. And well, everyone has aches and pains. That's not a big deal. But it's a big deal if uh, you're expected to be on treatment for the rest of your life and you have the aches and pains all the rest of your life. So that uh, there are a lot of clinical criteria that we have to look at and, uh, and find out what we want to uh, uh, achieve with treatment and listen very carefully to what uh, the uh, patients uh, themselves want to achieve with their therapy. That's a good point. I think philosophically it's interesting to me as someone who doesn't primarily manage CLL that there are a group of patients with FCR who have, again, you know, who have a, a, a better molecular phenotype. Uh, who really do very, very well. And I think that that's actually interesting and, and suggests how we may need to use risk factors in really trying to integrate with clinical factors in, in uh, you know, how we make decisions. And, and I actually want to